Okay, welcome to, to part two of the history of the electric power industry. So last time um, we talked about the, the developments uh, in the early days of the electric power industry that led to uh, this incredible decline in the cost of electricity that lasted um, about 60 or 70 years and how important this was uh, to the economic development of the United States. Um, we talked about what was responsible for this decline in prices. And there were two main things uh, that we identified. The first was technological. Um, Tesla's AC power system design, specifically the ability to increase the voltage of electricity at the source and transmit it uh, with limited losses of, uh, of power over long distances via high voltage transmission lines, um, meant that we were able to produce electricity in a centralized way, which means we could put a few really, really big power plants far away from people and, de and deliver all the electricity we needed um, by, by sending that electricity over transmission lines at high voltages. Um, this coupled with the monopoly consensus, this realization um, that uh, it made financial and economic sense to allow one utility over a certain geographical area to own and operate everything, and then to also protect those utilities from, comp from competition and to give them a, a legal pathway to covering their costs um, so as to, to maintain their financial health and uh, a lower cost of capital. These things put together um, allow utilities to take advantage of tremendous economies of scale. Now, the problem uh, became apparent in the second half of the 20th century. Um, and the, the fund fundamental issue is that utilities uh, and utility commissions um, who were tasked with regulating the decisions that were being made by utilities about what new generating capacity to, to build thought that electricity demand in the United States was going to continue to increase on a nonlinear, almost exponential uh, trajectory. What in fact happened is that demand increased, but it increased uh, linearly at a constant rate. And so what this meant is that demand was not nearly as high as utilities and system planners thought it was going to be. And as a result of unexpectedly low electricity demand, um, utilities and utility commissions uh, increased prices on individual customers. And we talked about why this occurred last time. Um, utilities built too much capacity, specifically they spent a lot on nuclear power plants, um, that in the end they, they realized they didn't actually need in order to meet electricity demand. Um, and even though uh, demand was lower, the costs associated with building and maintaining those plants stayed about the same because a significant portion of those costs um, that the utility was responsible for paying on an annual basis um, was tied up in the mortgage payments that they had to make to, to pay off all the debt they borrowed to build the plants in the first place. So who took the blame? Uh, the state government uh, in general. So the utility commissions that were part of the state government um, had approved and sometimes ordered the construction of costly nuclear power plants that were not needed. So what happened next? Um, well, it was clear at this point that the monopoly consensus, while it had been a tremendous success for uh, 60 or 70 years, um, was no longer, in some cases, the best policy. In many ways, it removed incentives uh, to in increase efficiency, um, to innovate, um, and the thought in many cases was that um, there needed to be different market actors, and we might even say competition, um, in how electricity is generated and, and sold. So what happened next is that there were several federal policies over the next several decades that were enacted that in some cases intentionally and in other cases unintentionally led us to this path, on this path, um, of increased competition uh, in the electricity business. So one of the first um, federal acts that was, um, that was passed was the, in the Public Utilities Regulatory Policies Act, or PURPA, um, which was passed in 1978 um, under Jimmy Carter's administration. And, and so ostensibly, um, the purpose of PURPA, 
um, was to encourage more energy efficient and environmentally friendly commercial energy production. So the context here uh, is that the United States had gone through uh, an oil crisis, a, a tremendous shortage of oil um, in the earlier in the 1970s, um, and then went through another one uh, in, in the late 1970s. And so there was tremendous um, economic interest um, on the part of the United States and, and the U.S. government um, in making sure the United States was a bit more self-reliant on energy um, and less vulnerable to external shocks in the prices of commodities. Uh, and so before uh, PERPA in the United States, um, only utilities acting as what we would call load serving entities. So utilities that were ultimately delivering physical power to retail customers could own and operate power plants. And this is consistent um, with what we talked about last time in the monopoly consensus that lasted from 1910 to 1970. So not anybody could just decide to build and operate a power plant. The, the deal that we struck with utilities was that we were going to protect them from competition. And this wasn't to do a favor for them. This was in our own self-interest. We wanted to have uh, monopoly utilities operating um, in order to uh, eliminate redundancy in infrastructure and overhead. Um, if we allowed single utilities to operate without competition over given geographical areas, um, it, made her, it made it easier uh, for us to, and the utilities to realize economies of scale and for them to keep prices low. And what PERPA did is it allowed for the existence of independent or non-utility power producers. So specifically, PERPA obligated uh, the incumbent monopoly utilities to sign long-term uh, contracts to buy power from what we would call qualifying facilities or QFs uh, that were owned by independent producers. And these could be factories or mills that produce smaller amounts of electricity for their own needs, um, but might have surplus and would like to have some place to sell that surplus electricity. And there was a significant amount of emphasis on what we would call code generation plants. Um, so these would be facilities that are already producing steam um, for district heating, um, but could also use some of that steam uh, to produce electricity. If you remember the way uh, steam generators work. Um, they are using uh, pumps to pump water into a boiler. The boilers using combustion or nuclear fission are heating that water up into steam. Uh, the pressurized steam is passed through uh, a larger opening, which allows the, the steam to expand and that expansion spins a turbine. So facilities are already generating steam for district heating. Um, producing electricity using that steam uh, might be a useful byproduct, and, um, but they would need to have some ability to sell that electricity. So PERPA also ultimately, um, although not really in the 1970s, it opened the door for renewable energy providers, um, even though they, at the time they weren't very cost effective. So the goal of PERPA was to make sure, in essence, that we weren't wasting cheap electricity. And this was sort of in the spirit of trying to protect the United States economically uh, against uh, some of the, the damages that were and vulnerabilities that were identified during the uh, oil crises in the 1970s. Its big impact, though, uh, was really uh, to allow entities to make it legally acceptable uh, for entities other than the monopoly, monopoly utilities uh, to participate. And this was really important for the future of electricity markets. So the next uh, major piece of legislation and rulemaking that had a big impact on the electric power industry was the Energy Policy Act of 1992. And this was uh, passed by Congress under the George H.W. Bush administration. So what this did is it allowed for wholesale trading of electric power. So we had PERPA that introduced independent power producers owning uh, qualifying facilities or QFs um, that were uh, signing long-term contracts with utilities um, under federal law. Utilities had to sign contracts with them. Um, and, and what the Energy Policy Act of 1992 did is it, is it allowed independent power producers other than the qualifying facilities, other than those 
sort of mills and factories that are producing a little bit extra or the very efficient uh, cogeneration plants to sell power to utilities at a market price. It also allowed trading in the wholesale market for electricity as a commodity. And so this allowed for the presence of electricity brokers. In other words, um, entities, for-profit entities um, that would essentially buy electricity from somebody over to the left and sell that same electricity uh, to somebody on the right, even though they were not actually involved in the physical delivery of electricity. But if they were able to, to buy electricity at a cheap price from one person and, and sell it to another, um, they could make profits. So what do we mean by a wholesale electricity market? This is a really important concept uh, that's important to nail down. So before PURPA and the Energy Policy Act of 1992, the world looked like this. This is really what we talked about in class last time, the monopoly consensus. Um, this just sort of represents the fact that you would have one monopoly utility working in one state or geographical area, and they would have complete control over a pool of customers, um, and they would be selling electricity to those retail customers, so you and me, et cetera, um, at some sort of rate that was uh, regulated and approved by a public utility commission, such that it was covering the cost of service for the electric utility, plus giving them an ability to earn some sort of reasonable profit. And then in another state, there was a utility basically acting the exact same way. After PURPA and the Energy Policy Act of 1992, the world looked quite a bit different. Um, we still had monopoly utilities um, operating, and we still had those same retail customers uh, buying electricity from the monopoly, monopoly utilities. But uh, that power, that electricity was coming from, in some cases, uh, different places. You had the presence of independent power producers, both qualifying facilities and other non-qualifying facility independent power producers were able to uh, own and operate generating facilities and sell that electricity directly to the monopoly utilities who would then deliver it to us, the retail customers. You also had the presence of brokers um, that might buy electricity from an independent power producer and sell it for a little bit more money to a monopoly utility in order to make money. And then, of course, the monopoly utilities could, in fact, buy and sell electricity from each other. So the the interactions that we see at the top of this slide between the independent power producers, the brokers, uh, and the different monopoly utilities, um, this is what we would refer to as the wholesale market. The buying and selling of electricity between these entities is the wholesale market. And so at what price do the utilities, independent producers, and brokers buy and sell electricity to each other? Well, the market price. So remember last time, I really we, I emphasized the fact that in monopoly systems, we're really not thinking about microeconomics. We spent this whole lecture talking about um, micro, the law of supply and law of demand and market equilibrium and how prices go up and down. Uh, and then last time I told you to just forget about it because during the monopoly consensus, none of that mattered. Um, prices were controlled. Um, they were set at cost. Um, you know, at the cost of service under the monopoly consensus um, and regulated or kept uh, fair by uh, public utility commissions. And so finally, we get to this point in history where um, markets for electricity are actually starting to look a bit more like classical uh, microeconomic markets. Um, and so hold on to this thought. We'll come back to it in, in just a minute. So other major pieces of legislation and rulemaking. Uh, FERC orders 888 and 889. Uh, just a side note here, uh, FERC is refer is the actually the, FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Um, this is a, a federal regulatory body that's in charge of uh, interstate sales of, of natural gas and electricity. So uh, you could maybe then guess that these orders have something to do with interstate sales of electricity. Um, and they do, in fact, they had to do, to do directly with um, the operation of high voltage transmission lines that could be delivering electricity across state lines. So what these orders required is that transmission owners who were at the time, the monopoly utilities, the incumbents, um, were now required to provide open access to their transmission system 
and make public data regarding transmission availability. So why is this important? Well, let me give you an example. Let's go back to this post-PERPA, post-Energy Policy Act of 1992 world, where retail customers are still getting their electricity from these monopoly utilities, but uh, those monopoly utilities might be getting that electricity um, from independent power producers or brokers or from other mon monopoly utilities. So let's say we have monopoly one here, monopoly utility one here, who wants to buy electricity from the independent power producer. But it might be uh, the case that the only way for monopoly one to physically get delivery of that electricity is if the independent power producer sends it on lines that are owned by monopoly two. So what we don't want to have happen is Monopoly 2 to hold that situation hostage, right? You have two separate entities that want to do business to each other, and they, they need to send electricity on lines that are owned by Monopoly Utility 2. Um, we don't want the case being that Monopoly Utility 2 can just refuse this, um, which would reduce the market efficiency, right? So, you know, it might force uh, Monopoly Utility to buy electricity at a higher price, um, than it would otherwise, or the independent power producer might not be able to sell electricity at a high enough price just because this other actor is refusing to like, let electricity flow on its lines. So utilities now, because of FERC orders 888 and 889, had to allow other electricity to flow on their lines if possible. And so the sort of analogy you could think of here is that uh, high voltage transmission lines were now sort of treated like toll roads where um, you could use them, uh, but you would probably have to pay for their use. So just three years later, um, FERC went even further. The, the previous orders that um, were legally obligating um, utilities to uh, treat their lines as open access um, were, were not actually getting the job done. In other words, utilities were still finding ways to, um, to restrict uh, the use of their lines by, by other producers and, and, and buyers of electricity. And so finally in 1999, FERC passed Order 2000, and this forced the utilities to give up actual control of their transmission systems, but not ownership. In other words, these were now toll roads that were still owned by the utilities and they could collect money or fees for the use of their lines, but they had no ability to decide what electricity was flowing on their lines. That responsibility, um, the decision-making and the management of the transmission, uh, transmission lines was now given to what we would call independent system operators or ISOs, uh, or regional transmission organizations, or RTOs. And in some cases in the United States, these are sort of one and the same, these entities. Um, this is a map of where we have different ISOs and RTOs today. Uh, and you can see that in almost every case, um, these are spanning multiple states at one time, right? Uh, notable exceptions to that might be Texas, uh, California, uh, New York. But in every other case, you have these third-party nonprofit organizations, ISOs or RTOs, um, that are managing the day-to-day -day operations of the transmission system, but they do not own the assets. And um, they oversee transmission interlinked networks um, that, uh, that, that span state boundaries. So at this point in history, we have a couple things in place. Number one is firms other than monopoly utilities are now able to sell electricity uh, to utilities. Um, and transmission lines are now open access and managed by neutral third parties. So in essence, we have all the groundwork necessary for having competitive wholesale electricity markets.